Good to see everybody. So, uh, so the article that we looked at for today, it kind of lays out the situation, right? That by the year 2050, we're going to have, in all likelihood, 2 billion more people on the planet. Um, but, you know, they argue that because in addition to the population getting larger, uh, there's economic development happening, right? And when economic growth happens, people like to eat more meat and those kinds of things. So because of those things, uh, they argue that globally, uh, we're probably going to need to grow twice as much food in the year 2050 as we uh, currently do now. So even though we're not adding twice, even though we're not doubling the population, because uh, countries are growing economically, they're going to want to eat more meat, which of course means they're higher up on the food web, so more energy required to produce uh, food higher on the food web. So uh, a need uh, to grow twice as many crops as we currently grow. And so you think, oh my gosh, like how are we going to do that? How, is that possible? Well, these authors say, yeah, we can, we can pull it off. Um, and so there was uh, a panel of, of scientists that uh, worked through the numbers and looked at a few strategies and figured out that, in fact, this is something that we can do globally. This is something we can do. Uh, and they mentioned kind of five general strategies that would allow us uh, to do that. Anybody like to share one of those strategies? Yeah, Raven. Excellent. Yeah, good. Freezing agriculture's footprint. Absolutely. In fact, that's the first one that I had. And here, I'll just click on to that. Freezing agriculture's footprint. So we looked at all the land that we're growing food on already. We can't convert more land to agriculture because what's going to happen if we convert more and more land to agriculture? Why is that a negative thing? Yeah, absolutely. It's an increase in our carbon footprint. All those ecosystem services that those trees do, like, I don't know, producing oxygen for us to breathe. All those things, right, we'll have less and less of. Yeah, so freeze agriculture's footprint is the first thing. They argue we can't turn more and more and more land under the plow. Uh, what else? What are some of the other five, other four that they had? Yeah, Isaiah. Yep, absolutely. So on the, pl on the farms that we're growing things already, um, we can grow more in some places. So we talked about the Green Revolution and this idea that we increased production massively in the last century, um, and that we can still do that in a lot of areas. So they had this little map of places in the world where we're growing food, and the darker red colors uh, are places where we can grow a fair amount more in the places that we're already having farms, so without putting more land under the plow. And so you can see, you know, not a lot of that land in the U.S., but down into Mexico, Central America, South America, a lot of places in Africa and Asia. So yeah, good. Growing more on the farms we've already got. Good. So we got two out of the five. What else do they say we should do? Yeah, uh, yeah. Produce waste. Uh, reduce waste. Sorry, not produce. Reduce waste. What, what was the other one? Yeah, change diets. Absolutely. So getting to those two. They mentioned that we can be more efficient in how we use resources. So for instance, like, uh, you know, back in the day when people fertilized land, they would just spread fertilizer all over the fields. And uh, as much as a half of those nutrients would actually go back up into the air, they'd, they'd, they'd go into the gaseous form and not get into the plant. But now, farmers do things like use global positioning system technology to determine what parts of their field are high in nutrients and what parts are low in nutrients. And then you couple that, that GPS, you know, like the same thing you have in your car, right? Like a GPS that tells you where you are. You couple that GPS with, with a tractor that, you know, it tells that tractor where to put a lot of fertilizer, where to put a little. We're getting technology that allows us to be a lot more efficient in how we do this. Uh, and shifting diets, uh, as we discussed the other day, right, again, eating higher on the food web requires more energy. Uh, and this stat we saw, again, kind of mind-blowing, right, that only about 55% uh, of the world's crop calories feed people directly. 
a lot of that is going to animals. And where else is that crop, are those crop calories going besides animals? Fuel is the other big one, right? Because we're producing more and more ethanol for fuel. So we're, we're using more and more of our crops to feed, feed uh, livestock and to produce uh, ethanol, which we, um, yeah, which we of course use for, for fuel. Which is a good thing in the sense that we're not using fossil fuels, uh, but it means that we're diverting a fair amount of our, our uh, agricultural production away from things that are feeding people directly, right? Which makes it hard to, um, to produce enough. And uh, is reducing waste. Uh, and, and again, like numbers that are crazy, right? I mean, who would have thought that approximately a quarter of all the world's food calories are lost before they're even consumed? Pretty, uh, pretty amazing stat. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that it happens in both what we term developed countries, right? Countries like the U.S. where we're doing really well economically and the quote unquote developing countries that are still kind of going through that demographic transition to an industrial society. So it's happening in both places, but in a little different way. Do y'all remember? Uh, and you might see it on here, in developing countries, how most of that waste is happening? Why is there so much food that's being wasted? So these would be places like India, countries in Africa, other countries in Asia. Like lost in transport, right? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of it is lost uh, in, in transport before it gets to market because there's not as good preservation technologies, refrigeration technologies. So a lot of it is lost in the transport process before it gets to the table. Uh, on the other hand, in uh, more economically developed countries, how is the waste happening? Yeah, it just gets thrown out at the table, right? At the, at the consumer end. And, and I thought it was interesting, like, because in the article, because, you know, sometimes you read these articles about, like, how do you fix the world? And you're like, well, okay, these are interesting things, but, like, what can I personally do, right? Like, use resources more efficiently in farming. Like, what am, what am I going to do to help farmers use resources more efficiently? Like, I probably won't do too much. But, but they talk about this as being a place where, like, all of us can play a role, right? Because most of the waste in the developed country is, um, yeah, right. It's the, it's, it's like our parents told us when we were growing up, right? Not to, not to waste the food, not to throw off the food, right? So you know, for all of us, like taking smaller portions and not wasting food, um, is gonna is gonna reduce waste here. And also, uh, at the retail side, right? So a lot of restaurants and uh, grocery stores, those kinds of things. Um, you know, when, when they don't sell all their food, it gets, it gets wasted as well. So, um, yeah, in this bottom cartoon here, it talks about the calories lost or wasted per person per day. Um, anyway, and this study estimates that, um, so this is, this is total. So in, in total, North America and Oceania, which is like Australia in that area, um, about 1,500 calories wasted uh, per person, but about 60% of that is by the consumer. So estimates that like on average, like according to this estimate, we're wasting like what, 60% of 1500, like we're wasting like eight, 900 calories per person per day on average, which is a lot, right? So, so anyway, I don't know. I, I, uh, after reading this article, <laughs> I'm a little more careful about like cleaning my plate, right? Only taking as much food as I need. So what were your thoughts on reading this? Any questions, comments? Yeah. Totally agree. I think it's going to be hard. But remember, like, 
our thinking hasn't always been that way, right? Like, if you go back decades, like, our thinking was very different. So, like, I, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so I think, like, it's easy to fall into the trap of, like, how can everybody change? And so that's why I always try to bring it back to, like, and I'm sure you do, too, like, like, what can I do, right? Like, like okay, so, yeah, like, maybe <laughs> all the people in the U.S. aren't going to change how they eat overnight. Like, that's fine. But maybe, like, I can take, I can try to waste less food, you know. Maybe when there's, you know, an entree that has, like, beef versus chicken or vegetables, maybe if the vegetable one looks good, maybe I'll go with that one today or the chicken, you know. So I totally agree. Like, it's so, like, you know, it's so easy to fall into the trap of, like, this is how we live as a society. Like, how are we going to change all of society? And so, and I think the only way it changes is, like, person by person, right? Because then when you're doing it, maybe your friends see you doing it, maybe your family sees you doing it, and they're like, huh, like, what are you doing? And then it kind of, like, spreads. But I totally agree. Like, when you look at it across the whole society, it's like, How's it going to happen? But so that's why I think, like, yeah, kind of it starts individually. So yeah, good, good point. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great point. That's a great point. And to be honest, like, I'm an environmental scientist, but when I first read this article a few years ago, like, I didn't necessarily understand, like, all these huge numbers and those sorts of things. Yeah, I don't know. So how do we... <laughs> I just think it's... I don't know. I just think it's all person to person. So, like, maybe you have a conversation with somebody at your in your town or maybe... Yeah. I don't think I don't think I think people are generally want to fix things but they don't have any problems with it. Yeah, I I totally agree. Totally agree. I think most people want to do do the right thing. And and I feel like people are very you know, in this climate are very distrustful of things they see in the media here and there and so like so this is a bit off topic, but there's an interesting study, so like climate change, right? There's some people that say, like, climate change is real and it's caused by humans, and, and that's kind of what the data support. Then there's folks that say that, like, it isn't real and it's not happening. And they did this interesting study where they asked people, like, like they, they looked at, like, the sources of information they trusted. So, like, I'm a scientist, so I'd like to think that, like, yeah, man, if they see science, they're going to be like, yeah, the data say this. I'm going to believe this, right? That's not the case. Like, people are much more likely to listen to somebody that they know and trust than they are to, like, a graph of data, you know? And so, like, yeah, so I just think, like, like, I'd like to think that if we put, like, a billboard up with, like, a graph on it, you know, people would be like, yeah, man, I got to think that. But I just think it's much more likely that people will, like you say, will get educated in things from, like, a conversation with you and a friend, you know, or a conversation with you and a family. So... Yeah, my whole thing, I don't know. I've just seen so many times that, like, it's, it's all about just, like, these little conversations with people, you know, and, and being humble about it, right? Like, you can't be like, hey, I know the answer. Like, listen to me. you got to be like, hey, like, I read about this. I learned about this. Like, what do you think? And then we can learn things from other folks, too. And, but, yeah, I know it's easy to, <laughs> to look at the status quo and be like, oh, what's going to happen? Yeah. No, they, they, they do, yeah. So part of the reason is because there there's a lot of methane produced from their digestive system. Um and also from like all of their, their waste. Like it nitrogen things goes up into the atmosphere. So uh huh. If we end up needing to have more livestock, is that not gonna be a negative side effect? 
You're exactly right. So that's why, like, that's why they're advocating like shifting diets, right? So that when countries become economically strong, like, they don't just automatically feed higher on the food chain, right? Exactly. So, and it's so interesting again because, you know, you can look at it as like a meat vegetarian thing, but you know, even difference between say chicken and beef is like pretty big, or, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so interesting. So I, I, I flew right by these slides because you all were giving me the points already, which is awesome. But, but one thing I mentioned in this article is, um, yeah, so the negative impacts of agriculture and like one of the things they say is that agriculture emits more greenhouse gases than all the cars, trucks, trains, and airplanes combined. So, so yeah, like the way we, our food systems have like a huge environmental impact, right? And then these other things they put out there as well, right? So we'll talk more about the greenhouse gases part later um, in the course, but connects here. And they talked about also like agriculture is our largest user of water resources. Like we're thinking about conserving water. Well, our food systems come into play there. It's not just about like not leaving the water running when you're brushing your teeth, although that reduces your water use, which is good. You know, p pollution as well, right? That like all the stuff we put on the agriculture fields, a lot of it washes off. Um, and then really the first point connects with this one, the idea of freezing agriculture's footprint as was mentioned, right? Because y'all have, have probably heard the, this narrative in, 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 in the Amazon of slash and burn agriculture, right? Where um, forests are cut and the trees are burned and then those nutrients are used to grow crops. Uh, and of course, as we do that, we're not only affecting ecosystem services, we're, we're losing habitat, right? So we lose ability for species to be there. So yeah, so um, the article kind of starts off by, by pointing out that these issues all do kind of come from agriculture. Yeah, awesome. Well, I appreciate all the points y'all have brought out um, so far. Anything else you wanted to chat about or questions you had from this article? Yeah. Um, what do you think would be like a good way to combat this problem um, if our country wasn't going to rely on these like big industrial farms and like a conscious industrial farming? Do you think it would be a good idea for like the government to um, I mean, it's really interesting. So, 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 what do y'all think? Like, from the article, anybody get any any feel about like would would a change in government policies play play a role? Any thoughts on that? It kind of reminds me of the point that the sustainable development article made about how like we've kind of lacked in some cases like the political will to really move towards sustainability. And as you all know, our political system is complicated. Do we have any political science majors in here? I'm not going to call on you, but I'm just curious. Right. I mean, we know it's complicated. Like it's democracy, right? So majority rules. Then, we, you know, you have special interests and lobbying groups. And it's such a, for instance, um, the Farm Bureau has a really strong lobbying presence, right? Um, and so agriculture as, it's, as, a, as an industry has a really big lobbying pre presence. So of course the short answer is yes, right? Like if we set government policies that put all these things into effect, then certainly it would have a positive impact. But the steps to making that happen, I think, first of all, we have to have like collective will, like as was mentioned, people have to become aware of these things they have to have conversations so that it matters to people, um, you know. And but even beyond that, like the lobbyists and other folks that can kind of come into the picture. So, 
I just think it always has to start at the grassroots. And I think with local government, it's different too. So for instance, the city of Asheville uh, and um, the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners, they've both come up with, for instance, initiatives on having 100% renewable energy in government buildings by, by 2050, which is awesome and which would never come from like the federal government, right? Which is okay, like that's fine. So I think, yeah, I just think the importance of working at the grassroots local levels, like I think that's where it has to lead from. I think leading from the top is just, it would be great <laughs> to, to, to come up with like a national policy tomorrow that implements all these things, but it's so complicated, so many different user groups. I think it almost has to start more at the local level, but that's just me talking. I don't know, man, Ta we should probably bring a political scientist in to talk about that policy piece as well. Um, is there another question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally agree, totally agree. So that's, <laughs> I, there used to be like a cliche saying back in the day, think globally, act locally. I still kind of think it's a really important thing. Like think about what we need in the big picture, but like start implementing it like in your own life, in your own family, like within your own friends first, right? And then, then you try to work up. Anyway, yeah. So, um, yeah, interesting article. It, it sort of makes it look pretty straightforward, right? A path toward feeding more people on the planet without a huge environmental cost. But as was mentioned, uh, there are lots of issues that it gets um, tied up in. Okay, so these five points then, um, pretty important. So, um, so, so last time we started chatting about genetically modified organisms, which uh, could very well be a part of our, our path forward, uh, but uh, important to understand. In fact, they're part of our, where we are right now. So I talked about, first of all, the fact that genetically modified organisms are different from products of selective breeding. Yeah, think like dog breeds, right? That's what you can do when you work with the gene pool and just selectively breed parts of it, right? You can get very specific things, just like you can get different vegetables from one particular species here. But with GMOs, it's different because we bring in uh, genetic material from a whole different species and we use um, biological, cellular and molecular biological techniques to introduce that G the DNA uh, from a different organism into the genome of whatever we're looking at. We talked about this last time. And um, just a, a couple examples, uh, and then I want to chat a little bit about potential um, pros and cons of GMOs. But there have been a couple success stories here. If you remember last class, anybody remember any examples of GMOs we talked about in last class? Yeah. So you're making me think that I did a poor job explaining it because you're exactly right. There is a variety of, of wheat that has a short stock and has heavier grains, but that was produced from selective breeding. So I didn't make that clear. Thank you for bringing that up. So, so the variation of wheat that was higher producing and uh, had better yield, that was the product of selective breeding. So they just selected the traits they wanted in that plant and bred them over time. Anybody remember any examples of GMOs? Like bananas, and bananas with what? So I don't know that we talked about that in this class. That may very well be a GMO. I don't know. We talked about glow in the dark cats. Yes, I had the picture of the scary glow in the dark cats. Any any other ones? Yeah, there was a flavor saver tomato that had the gene from uh, an 
an ice fish that kept it from freezing, but it also made it taste pretty bad, apparently, because you can't buy it anymore. They don't make it anymore. Yeah? So that was selective breeding, yeah. So the, the broccoli, cauliflower, uh, Brussels sprouts, and kale, yeah, that's all selective breeding from one species. Yeah, I, you guys are real, making me realize I did a poor job of <laughs> differentiating that. Yeah, so that was selective breeding. Um, the high-yield wheat was selective breeding. Uh, GMOs were um, the gene from the ice fish and the tomato. There was a, they put a gene from a, uh, from a wasp in cabbage so that the cabbage would produce venom. I don't know if we mentioned that or not. And so that makes it resistant to pests because they're, you know, the venom's toxic to some of those insect pests that would come and eat the cabbage. Um, supposedly safe for people, I guess. Wasp venom is, I guess we can digest it, I don't know. Speaking of wasps, you guys, I felt really bad on Thursday. I went out with my student to do research in the Swannanoa River, and we, we had a, another student that was volunteering with us. We were going through the woods to it, and we came across a nest of yellow jackets. Oh, it was bad. It got stung like seven or eight times. It was so bad. I feel bad. Sorry, that just popped into my head, and I thought I'd bring it up. But anyway, here's a, so here's a positive example of, um, of a GMO. This is golden rice. So vitamin A is associated with uh, development of the eyes. So if you don't get enough vitamin A as a child when your eyes are developing, you can actually uh, go blind. So um, up to half a million children go blind each year due to vitamin A deficiency. And rice is the biggest staple food globally in the population. And so in this genetically modified organism, uh, it takes a gene I think it's from a sweet potato that produces vitamin A, and then it put that gene into the rice genome, and so now the rice produces a vitamin A, and so it's called golden rice because it has this yellowish um, color to it, and uh, so it, um, it allows the rice to produce the vitamin A uh, itself, and so this is um, a way to, uh, to reduce blindness due to vitamin A deficiency. And, and it, this is kind of a nice example because this genetic, genetically modified rice uh, was donated um, for use uh, around the world. It takes time and money to develop GMOs. So often when they're developed, they'll be patented. And you're only able to use them if you, if you purchase the rights to use that. Um, genetically modified organism. So this is kind of nice that this patent was donated for use. Anyway, um, so there are, some, there are some advantages to genetically mod modified organisms, some things that we can get from them. Uh, what are some of the things we can, we can uh, accomplish by genetically modifying species? Any thoughts? We've mentioned a couple already, but... Okay, yeah. Way to produce, to produce less waste in general, uh-huh. Yeah. Pretty much, I was just going to say, like, more durable crop yields. Mm-hmm, okay, yeah. So, yeah, like, increasing crop y yields in general. So, there's, 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 there's a couple, what? Oh, no. That's weird, my slide. Those are negative impacts of GMOs. Shoot, it, uh, you know what? I was modifying this and it came. Oh. Well, so. I apologize, I'm not sure how that happened. So you can see them all now. But, but these are, are some, some negative impacts of GMOs that we saw. And then I'll, I'll mention some of the benefits. But. So I think a lot of this falls under the category of like Jurassic Park. Like when you mess with nature, you just never really know what's going to happen. But so part of the idea is that like this is when, when we put a genetically modified 
crop in the ground, it's not in the lab anymore. It's out in nature, right? And so you're not really sure how it's going to affect other species. So um, this idea of potential harm to other organisms, and that includes resist evolution of resistance by pests. So like, like with the cabbage example, with the, with the wasp venom in it, you know, um, if there's variation in the, uh, the tolerance of uh, that venom, then you would expect the most tolerant pests to survive. Their offspring would be tolerant. And so we can have uh, resistance to, um, to the GMOs if uh, gen the genetic modification like, is essentially a way of killing pests, right? So, you know, how do, how do, how do plants reproduce? Like, how, do, how does, like, wheat reproduce? Do we know? What? Yeah, seeds get blown on the wind, and the seeds have to be fertilized as pollen. Yeah, there's, it's moving back and forth. And so, for instance, uh, genetically modified corn is grown all over North and Central America. And there are also wild varieties of corn. It's called maize, like the wild, like the, the wild ancestor of maize. And so there's been some evidence that genes can transfer from one species to another because when the pollen that's genetically modified gets blown on the wind and uh, encounters another species that's closely related enough, there's some, uh, some evidence that those genes can transfer uh, among species. I think about this when we, when we think about like the flavor saver tomato, you know, that like maybe you're allergic to ice fish proteins, right? I mean, you've never been allergic to tomatoes, but now when we start putting like new proteins and things into new chemicals into our food, like there's the potential that, um, that we could have, have allergies to those and then other health effects as well. Then there's the whole question of like, if you're a vegetarian, <laughs> and there are like fish proteins in a tomato, like is it still a vegetarian tomato? Like, I don't know, like what do you think? Yeah. So we're going there. That's a really good question. So how do you know if food is genetically modified or not, and how widespread is it? Yeah, so the short answer is very widespread already, and we do require some kinds of labeling. Um, and that's, that's changed, actually, in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so, so these two are maybe kind of closely related, that if there are genetically modified crops out there that are able to interbreed with closely related species, then that could could be a problem. And just to put these, these last, oh sorry, these last ones on there. Um, the labeling in general is a big concern with GMOs because if you don't want to eat GMOs, how do you know if a product contains them or not? <clears throat> but then there's this one, right? What if the seeds for genetically modified crops are a lot more expensive than the non-genetically modified ones, and they are more expensive because it takes lots of time and money to produce them. Well, what does that do to farmers who may not have a whole lot of, of profit margin, right? Especially, what does it do if, um, for instance, crops that have been genetically modified to increase yield are being grown by all the other farmers, and you don't grow that crop, right? You're going to have lower yields. So there's this whole weird thing, like, can you patent nature? Like, can you patent a species? Like, that's kind of a funny thing to think about, because scientists do patent GMOs. So like, this type of corn, like, it's patented. Like, you can't grow it if you don't have the, um, the, the permit. So I don't know. This is kind of a list of potential negative impacts that have been out there. Any, any others? That you know the things that make you feel kind of weird about GMOs? Yeah.
Oh, that's interesting. How, how are they using it? Are they, so is it like a modified spider or something? Oh, interesting. So, like, you take the gene from the black widow, put it into the yeast genome, and then the yeast produces silk. Huh. Wow. Yeah. Uh, some people might not be comfortable with the fact that if you look at a genome compared to a rare variety of silk, you know, you're looking at a different variety of silk than if you look at a different variety of silk. Huh. Yeah. Some people might not be comfortable with the fact that if you look at a genome compared to a rare variety of silk, you know, you're looking at a different variety of silk than if you look at a rare variety of silk. Huh. Is that right? I've never cut open this flavor saver tomatoes. Does it look like a fish inside? No. <laughs> Do you have a specific example you're looking at? Um, specifically tomatoes. Yeah. Because a lot of them are undistinguishable. Like corn, for instance, like looks the same like most of the GMOs. But so tomatoes? Uh-oh. Am I going to be scared and terrified here? Well, let me find a GMO and then let me find a GMO. Okay. Yeah. When you, cool. When, when you find it, you can show. So there's, there's a story of the economic sort of impacts of GMOs. Some of you may have heard the story, it's in your text, of Percy Schmeiser, who was growing um, this oilseed crop in, um, in Canada. And this area in Canada, British Columbia, there's lots and lots of this grown, just miles and miles of these fields. Well, he hadn't purchased the genetically modified seed but when the company came and tested his crop, they found the gene of the genetically modified seed in his crop. And he was sued by the company, essentially for growing the genetically modified seed without the, um, without the permit. Yeah. Which, do you know which GMO that is, which, which variety of tomato? Okay, interesting. Yeah, so that's a good point. They may, and that's like, as a company, like, you've got to think about, like, how will consumers respond to this GMO, right? Like, maybe people won't buy that anymore because it just looks strange. Uh, but anyway, so he argued that he didn't want the genetically modified seed. He said, you know, I hadn't bought it. But he said I didn't want it either. He said what must have happened is the pollen from the field next to me must have blown into my field. And that brought the genes in. Well, the problem is there's no way to tell like, where those genes came from. Uh, and so um, they, they settled out of court. Um, it, the, the, the company, um, uh, Monsanto, which, which makes the GMO, you know, they can't come across as saying it's okay to have their GMO without a permit. So who knows? He may have not ended up having to pay anything. It was a, an out-of-court settlement. But that's part of the problem, right? Like, how do you control for nature where, you know, species of nature will find a way? Jurassic Park, you guys, those dinosaurs, they made it out. They started killing people. It was crazy, right? So, you know, nature doesn't like our nice little boundaries that we want to put around them. And so... You know, Percy Schmeiser's case was, you know, again, he was sued by this huge company for having their genetically modified seed when he honestly said, I didn't buy the seed and I don't want the seed. And his argument was that the pollen must have blown in from his neighbor's fields, bringing those genes. So it kind of highlights some of the economic challenges with genetically modified crops. So it's interesting, like, we've been genetically modifying crops for decades now. It's, this isn't a new thing anymore. And so people ask, like, you know, have GMOs really been contributing to solving our global food issue and issues? And this is a scientific paper uh, published in the journal Plant Science. And it was looking specifically at this idea that we could genetically modify crops to become drought tolerant, because that's one of the things you hear. You hear that we can make crops more tolerant of drought so that as some parts of the world are predicted to become hotter and drier through climate change, 
will be able to keep growing food. You've, that's one same thing that's been said a lot. And so these authors looked at, so more than two decades of plant biotechnology, essentially modification of plant genes, to improve crops. And, and what they found, I'll just read this to you, it's hard to see. It says, after more than 20 years of research and investment, only a few such products have reached the market. Uh, and they basically make the point that up to now, we haven't really seen a big impact of increasing drought tolerance uh, in, in crops. So from this uh, angle, uh, we haven't really seen a big increase in GMO, a, a big benefit to crops from GMOs. Now, in some others, you can argue that, that there have been. So there's that. So you ask the question, what percentage of crops uh, in the US are genetically modified? Uh, cotton, 96% of U.S. cotton is genetically modified. So if you have clothes or things that contain cotton grown in the U.S., it's likely genetically modified. Uh, sugar beets, 95%. Soybean, 94%. Corn, 93%. So if you're eating corn, there's a really good chance it's been genetically modified. Uh, canola oil, again, about 90%. Um, and uh, a couple other crops as well here. So the bottom line is, corn and soy in the U.S., it's, it's already, it is what it is. It's genetically modified. So there's, there's a new rule. So for the longest time, up until about two years ago, there were no labeling requirements at all for genetically modified organisms. You didn't have to put anything on the, on the, on the package. Now, that didn't keep companies from being proactive, right? So say that I don't use any genetically modified organisms in my product, and I want people to know that. I can ask uh, a certified, like an agency to test mine, and then if mine don't have genetically modified organisms in them, they'll let me put their label on there. So like the non-GMO project, uh, if you see this label, then you know that the product doesn't have GMOs. Uh, so this is a way that companies could say, okay, look, people that have GMOs don't have to label their product as having GMOs, but I'm going to say specifically that mine don't, so that people who want to not eat GMOs can do that. But this is the label that's going to be required starting next year. And you might have noticed already, like in a lot of foods, it'll say made with bioengineered ingredients. And so bioengineered uh, is basically the same as genetically modified. So um, yes, I was noticing this on like a box of cereal the other day. A lot of them have these labels. So in the US, uh, for a long time, we didn't require any labeling at all. Starting next year, it will be required. Uh, but a lot of companies are proactively putting these labels on um, already. <clears throat> okay. Awesome. So that's going to wrap up our discussion of agriculture. Any questions or thoughts? Yeah. So it's really, so good, good, good question. So you'll notice, like, in those potential disadvantages of GMOs, we didn't say anything about proven negative health effects to people. Because the fact is, there really aren't any studies yet that have shown GMOs to have negative impacts on people. Uh, there have been studies on mice that have looked at, for instance, um, like, so long story short, I used to go into this a fair amount in this class, but the, the long and short of it is we don't have any evidence yet for negative impacts of GMOs per se on people. Um, what negative impacts we find in animals uh, are related to, um, so like there are some genetic, genetic modifications that, um, that 
uh, I've got to get my thinking straight on this. Basically, they've, they've, they've found like inflammation in the guts of mice and things in response to GMOs, uh, but it's been pretty extreme doses. And part of it is because GMOs are so broad. Like, you know, every gene leads to a different protein produced. So as of now, and I'll find some, I'll, I'll get some more specific cases to show you. I apologize, I should have this off the top of my head, but w there've been some, uh, there's been some evidence of negative impacts on, on mice, but it's been with really extreme diets of GMOs. So we really can't say across the board, like GMOs have negative impacts on people. We just haven't really seen it. Yeah. But there's this unknown factor, you know? Because those studies take a really long time to, to do. And there are some people that just, you know, just want to eat more naturally. So you totally understand when people want to do that. So, um, yeah. All right. So um, we're going to move on, shift gears a little bit here into to chapter 11 and chat about biodiversity. This is the biosphere where all the life that we have learned about so far lives. Although, did you guys hear it? Was it Venus where they found evidence for fossil water? Where was it? I think it was Venus. Anyway, we keep finding interesting evidence in different parts of the world, of the solar system. But as of now, all the life that we're aware of lives on this planet. So this is the blue planet, the biosphere. So let's talk a little bit about biodiversity. So what, what, what kinds of biodiversity are, are there? Like when I say biodiversity, what do, what do you all think of? The rainforest, rainforest uh-huh. What else? Fish, clearly. Salmon, right? So, coral reefs, reefs uh-huh. So we can think about it a couple of different ways as far as different kinds of biodiversity. So the first is maybe what we would just call species diversity. So literally just tallying up the number of species that are in an area. So we might look at this stream here, salmon here, there's this fish called a grayling that's like hanging out in there and I was like, wait, this isn't the crowd I came with, what's going on? Um, so you can just kind of tally up the number of species. There's another kind of diversity we talk with mem about, remember with regard to evolution, What kind of diversity did we talk about being important in, gen in uh, evolution? So genetic diversity is, uh, is the raw material for evolution, so that's super important. And then um, the final piece is what we would call ecosystem diversity. So kind of how, um, how our ecosystems work, like how how many different things are going on in our ecosystems at a certain time. And we'll chat about each of these separately. So here with our, with our river, we could kind of tally up the fish species to get our species diversity. We could look at how much these fishes differ one to another genetically and talk about our genetic diversity even within one species. Or we could talk about our ecosystem diversity and talk about all the things that are going on here with regard to, to um, the ecosystem uh, properties and services. We could talk about productivity here, what's going on in the water column, all kinds of stuff. So we'll start at the smallest level. So genetic diversity. So genetic diversity is just looking at how different the genes are from individual to individual. And we can do this uh, within a population or across populations. So we could ask the question for a population of cheetahs. I don't know why they're cheating. They shouldn't cheat, really, which reminds me of a joke. Do you know why nobody plays cards on the savanna in Africa? Because there's so many cheetahs. You're never going to win. There's so many cheetahs. Sorry, I can't help. 
Steven shared that joke with me on a field trip, and I'm like, I have to use that somehow. And there's a cheetah. Uh, it doesn't look like it's cheating right now. But it's no coincidence that we talked about the cheetah there. So you all probably know. You guys see the movie Ice Age? Right, what are the creatures? They're all going, they're all going south, right? Because the glaciers are coming from the north. You got like your mastodon, you've got what? The saber-toothed tiger, you've got what else? There's like sloth, there's like what else? Is there just those three or is there something else? Squirrel. There's that squirrel, squirrel, the squirrel. Sid. Sid. No, no that, Sid's a sloth. No, the the squirrel the squirrel doesn't have a name. It's just always trying to find a nut. It's just, I feel bad for the squirrel. Anyway, they're moving. The reason they're moving is because there's these giant sheets of ice coming south from the north. You don't want to be trapped under a giant sheet of ice. It's bad. You might notice that we don't have any more giant mammoths. At least I haven't seen any. He does have a name. It's Scrat. Scrat? Yeah. If that was my name, I wouldn't want anybody to know it either. Okay. Scrat. I did not know that. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, but sadly, we no longer have saber-toothed tigers. Maybe not sadly, because I wouldn't really want to run into one. But those giant mammals went away at the end of the last ice age. They could not make it through the ice age. Their populations got so small they went extinct. Humans also played a role. We'll talk about that later. We know that partly because uh, woolly mammoths existed on islands with no people longer than they did in places where there were people. Suffice to say, those species did not make it through the Ice Age. Well, cheetahs made it through, but just barely. Maybe they cheated. Maybe that's how they made it through the Ice Age. I don't know. They made it through the Ice Age, but there was a very small population of them that made it through. So because there was a very small population that made it through the Ice Age, when they reproduced and began reestablishing their populations, they started from just a few individuals. Now, what do you think about the genetic diversity of a small group of individuals versus a large group of individuals? Do you think the smaller group has more or less variety in their genes than the large group? If you said less, you win the prize, if I had a prize to give you. Yeah, so the small group of cheetahs made it through the Ice Age. So because of that, cheetahs have very low genetic diversity. They have lots of birth defects. They have very low reproduction rates. Um, and so because of that, uh, cheetahs, they're in bad shape. They can run really fast, man. Like, I don't know, maybe you guys could recruit some for the track team. I don't know. They're probably really, really fast. How fast do they run? Anybody know? 60 miles per hour? Man. But they'd have trouble, like, on the 400 meter, like, on the curves. Like, they'd be, like, their feet would be, like, flying out. Yeah, anyway. You think so? But if they, if they get more than a couple steps on the line, they're disqualified, right? So they have to be really careful. Like they don't, okay, all right. Anyway, uh, so genetic diversity, right? There's, there's these populations that some of them don't have a whole lot of genetic diversity. And so as we talked about, genetic diversity is important because um, that's how evolution works, right? If there's no variety, evolution can't function. So, so because of that, Cheetahs, uh, if there were some kind of really severe environmental um, disturbance, they'd have a, there's not much variation. They'd have a hard time making it through. Just barely made it through that ice age. So another reason that it's important uh, from a conservation perspective and management perspective is that it's the raw material for, for captive breeding. What do we mean by captive breeding? You ask, well, I'm glad you asked. Anybody know what this is? It's a type of wolf. It's actually a red wolf, yes. Um, so has anybody been to the Western North Carolina Nature Center? Actually, you know what? I think it's been closed since COVID went down. So if you've been there, you've been there. You haven't been there for the last, like, Seven months. What's that? The red pandas or foxes. Oh, yeah. Do they have some red pandas there now? Yeah. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. So they also have red wolves at the Western North Carolina Nature Center. 
And the Red Wolf, the story of the Red Wolf. So long ago, there was only one species of wolf east of the Mississippi. It was the Red Wolf. And in fact, it was the only top carnivore canine. Y'all heard of coyotes or coyotes? I don't know. You can say it either way. I don't mind. They only existed west of the Mississippi. Okay? Timber wolves, all that west of the Mississippi. So the red wolves were the top predator in this part of North America. Well, people don't like hanging out with top predators. Red wolves aren't, they're not really big. I don't like they're not as big as like the big timber wolves. They're a little smaller. But still, we don't like them around. And so so we hunted them and decreased their population greatly. Okay, so once their population dropped down, all of a sudden, the coyotes were able to come across the Mississippi. They came in canoes, they came in motorboats, they, came in, they just came, it was crazy. Um, no, I don't know how they came across, actually, but when the coyotes came across and the red wolves were no longer abundant, the coyotes got established. So, red wolf numbers had declined greatly. Not only that, they breed with coyotes. So, not only are these rare now, their populations have been decreased greatly, the few that are left, if they breed with coyotes, their genes get diluted and they essentially disappear. So, before that could happen, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service took these red wolves out of the wild and put them in zoos and made sure that they bred only with other certified red wolves. And so by doing that, they were able to ensure that the offspring were not combination red wolf coyotes, they were actual uh, red wolves. So the Western North Carolina Nature Center was one of the certified breeding centers for red wolves. They kept the red wolves there. They, um, and they sequenced the genome for each of those individuals. So then, when it was time for the red wolves to breed, I kid you not, they would literally fly a red wolf from another breeding facility. Some of these were in California, some of these were in Tennessee. And then they'd get them together to breed. And when they bred them, they tried to breed individuals that were most distantly related to each other, if that makes sense, right? Because then you're going to keep as much genetic diversity as you can. So the red wolves were listed on the Endangered Species Act. Well, they were proposed for listing on the Endangered Species Act. But it was recently decided by the US Fish and Wildlife Service not to keep them on the endangered species list, partly because the, the goal of the Endangered Species Act is to recover species so they can come back. And essentially, it was determined that the status of the red wolf, because populations are so small, because coyotes are established all throughout their range, that there's essentially no chance of recovering the red wolf. And so it was taken off the endangered species list, if that makes sense. And so this whole like, breeding program like, is now going to be like, dismantled unless a different ruling comes along. Yeah? They sure did, yeah. In um, Pocosin Wildlife Refuge on eastern North Carolina, they released some. They released some in a place in Kentucky called um, Land of Lakes or something like that. That's a brand of margarine. But I think it also might be a place in Kentucky. Um, yeah, so they released them in a couple areas. But essentially what they found is that they don't keep the coyotes out. So when the coyotes arrive, like, they breed with them and... Yeah, so anyway, so it's just an interesting kind of story. And it raises the question, like, I don't know, like, what do you guys think? Like, should they be taken off the endangered species list? Like, should we keep trying to preserve them when, like, there's really, in the foreseeable future, probably not any way to, like, reestablish them in nature? Like, I don't know. What do you guys think? The red wolf wants to know what you think. 
Actually, no. It's probably looking at a squirrel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's what the Fish and Wildlife Service decided. They're like, you know, we can't, it doesn't make any sense to keep spending all this money to keep this pure lineage of red wolves going if we don't have any way in the future of putting them back into nature, you know? So they decided, yeah. So, so anyway, so, so when we talk about genetic diversity, you know, the red wolves were an example of a captive breeding program. And so that's where you take a species out of nature and, and, the idea is help it breed in captivity until you can put it back in nature, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So, so anyway, um, yeah, you know what? Let's 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 wrap it up there. We'll start off with species diversity next time. Okay. <laughs>